Hey, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I know I haven't been on here in a long time. And I'm sorry, but I've been going through a lot of, a lot of trials and persecutions and pain and things. But no excuse. I just ain't felt led to do a video until now. But we, I'm gonna. This video is gonna be about <clears throat> the new covenant that we are under, the covenant of the New Testament of grace through faith, and how we're not under the old law or the old covenant anymore. And I'm going to be reading out of a book which quotes the Bible. And it's by Andrew Womack, the minister, famous on TV. One one of the f true ministers, I believe, that are actually still following the truth of the gospel and not corrupting it by the wealth and prosperity, feel-good-in-the-flesh, perverted gospel. And it's called The True Nature of God by Andrew Womack. And it was free. Now I'm going to start in the chapter on page 41, the law and faith. The law and faith. You might be thinking, who cares about the old covenant? Question mark. I don't offer blood sacrifices. I don't kill goats and sheep. I'm not under the old covenant. But I promise you, your theology, thinking, and attitudes are probably influenced by the old covenant to some degree or another. You may not be offering sheep and goats, but you may be offering works of self-sacrifice and self-punishment to atone for your sin and guilt. The religious attitude of the law will keep you from what you should do, from walking in intimacy with God. When you sin, the law causes you to focus on your sin, and focusing on your sin will keep you from entering into the holy of holies and calling on God, which is the only way you can get free from sin. The law keeps you from that kind of intimacy because you only see the wrath, the judgment, and the punishment of God upon your sin. When the law reveals your sin, your unworthiness, and your guilt, you generally run from God instead of running to God. Now, not everything from Genesis to Malachi is the law. There is also a tremendous amount of faith in the Old Testament. But we, we've got to look for it. This is because the Old Testament was basically an administration of the law. And the Bible says, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. Galatians chapter 3, 9 through 12. I'm glad Paul said that instead of me. I would get in trouble with the religious crowd for saying the law is not of faith. Put that together with Romans 14, 23. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, and the law is not of faith. So, and it becomes plain that a New Testament believer trying to please God by living under the Old Testament law is not in faith and is actually in sin. Did you know that trying to serve God the same way Elisha or King David did is sin for the New Testament believer? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, and the Old Testament law is not of faith. Those are both from the Bible. Four books of the New Testament were written for the sole purpose of trying to renew our minds from serving God under the Old Testament law. The entire books of Romans, Galatians, Hebrews, and the majority of the book of Ephesians in general, all of Paul's epistles are strong on this, the New Testament. The book of Romans was written to renew people's minds from the Old Testament law and works. Justification by works and by effort. The book of Hebrews emphasizes strongly that we recognize that Jesus has superseded everything in the Old Testament. Jesus is now our high priest, and we aren't operating under the blood sacrifices of bulls and goats, but are set free by the shedding of his sinless blood. The church has accepted the truth, that we no longer sacrifice animals, but the scriptures also go on to say that we are no longer operating under the same system of the law where our conscious, consciences should condemn us. 
Now I'm going to quote the Bible. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 10.2 The worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. So once you're purged by the blood of Jesus, you should have no more conscience of sins. The Bible says that believers should have their consciences purged to have no more consciousness of sin at all. That means no more awareness of sin. Quite a few people would probably like to stone me for saying this. They would say, brother, how dare you? We've got to keep the Ten Commandments. We've got to live under the Old Testament law. A lot of people believe we must keep the law, but most of them couldn't recite the Ten Commandments. Besides that, there are not just Ten Commandments, there are hundreds of commandments in the Old Testament law. Most people don't know what they are, and yet they insist we've got to live under them. At best, that's just being inconsistent. People who really believe that should know what the commandments are. Many scriptures bear this out. Quoting the Bible, Galatians 2, 16-21. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed when we died on the cross and rose again in baptism, I make myself a transgressor. A transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. That's what baptism signifies. We're dying to the old law and rising again under the new law. We're dying to the old body of sin and rising again into the new spirit. That we are renewed in. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Which means for no purpose. The death of Jesus Christ is of no effect if living under the Old Testament law is the way to please God and be justified by Him. It makes the death of Christ in vain. It would frustrate the grace of God. Many of us have unconsciously frustrated God's grace, His goodness, His love, His mercy extended toward us because we didn't understand who God really is and what He is really like. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage which comes under the old law. That's Galatians 5, 1. Do you know, do you know what he made us free from? Question mark. Some people will say sin. But what was the strength of sin? The Bible says it was the law. The law gave strength to sin. The whole book of Galatians shows us that Jesus Christ made us free from the bondage of the Old Testament law that condemned us. We have seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7 through 9 that the Old Testament law was an administration of death and condemnation. Do those sound like things God wanted to do? Did God want to administer death to us? Did he want to make us feel condemned? That was never God's intention. We saw in Romans chapter 3, 19 through 20 that by the law we received the knowledge of sin, by the old law. That's how we had knowledge of sin, because of the old law showing us that sin was working in our members, our body. That all the world could become guilty and every mouth should be stopped before God. The law gave us knowledge of our sin, and it made us feel guilty before God. 1 Corinthians 15.56 says the strength of sin is the law. The law actually gave strength to sin. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead, because there was no knowledge of it without the law. So it didn't get, wasn't counted against us. For I was alive without the law. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, when the commandments came, sin revived because we had knowledge of it, and I died, because sin brings death. And when you have knowledge of it, it's held against you. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. 
for sin taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Romans 7, 8 through 11. Sin produced negative effects. The law produced a negative effects. The law made us knowledgeable of our sin, and it made us hopeless about how we could ever approach God. God didn't want to give the total knowledge of sin, but because he didn't reveal his wrath on sin, people justified their sin in the Old Testament. They did not understand how deadly sin was, and therefore, they were embracing it. They were just living totally unrestrained lives, and because of that, Satan was dominate, dominating the human race. Because Satan has his strength through the old law. That's what the Bible says. Until Jesus came to earth, God had to put... Before Jesus came to earth to set us free, God had to put some temporary restraint upon sin to keep it from multiplying, dominating, and destroying the human race. He added the Old Testament law because of the abundance of transgressions, but only as a temporary measure until Jesus could come. God didn't really want us to know how rotten we were, but he had to use the law to restrain sin because people had to become de had became deceived into thinking sin was all right. Another bad effect of not having the law in place was that God was not fully judging sin. Lightning wasn't striking people every time they committed sin because of what seemed to be a lack of seriousness towards sin. People were thinking, well, I know I should be better, so I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. I'm not going to beat my wife anymore. I'm not going to drink anymore. They would improve their lives and start trusting in their own goodness, which would cause them to say, well, I'm pretty good. I'm really very good now. I think I'm going to make it to heaven. They didn't consider the seriousness of the sin they still had in their lives. Today we hear the same thing. People are saying, <clears throat> how could a loving God send people to hell? God's going to accept people whether they're Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or whatever. It doesn't matter. Just as long as they're doing the best they can do, God's going to accept them. That's not the truth. It's a deception. <laughs> With the, without the law, mankind began to think, well, just do the best you can do and God's going to accept you. They didn't understand how deadly sin was because God hadn't pu punished it. So God began to reveal his true wrath on sin by giving the law, the old law. God's intention in giving us the law, the old law is very similar to child training. You can't get a two-year-old child to obey you by telling them, look, the reason you are not supposed to take a toy from your sister is because God says you should share. God says you should give and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So every time you take a toy from your sister, you are really just stealing it from her. You are obeying the devil. And every time you obey the devil, you are giving him access to your life. You are learning the ways of the devil, and if you continue in his ways, when you are 20 years old, that's going to get you fired from your job and mess up your marriage. You're going to have all these problems, and you'll never amount to anything. If you start explaining something like that to a two-year-old, they're just going to stare at you. They don't understand all those complex thoughts. They don't understand God. They don't understand the devil. They don't understand resisting the devil. They don't understand demonic spirits. They don't understand any of it. So what do you do? Some people just say, well, I'm going to leave them alone until they're old enough to reason with. Well, if you wait that long, you're in trouble. God gave you a temporary measure for dealing with the wrong behavior in your young children. The Bible calls it the rod, but most people call it a spanking or getting swats. You can successfully get a two-year-old to obey by saying you may not know anything about God or the devil, but you do it again and you're going to get a spanking. The child may not know who the devil is, but the next time the devil says, steal that toy or hit that child, they'll say no. They'll resist the devil. You can get them to resist sin and conform to a holy standard out of fear of punishment. This is without them even knowing what sin is or who the devil is. You can get them to fear the rod, and I guarantee you it will get them to comply. On a temporary basis, the rod is a good and useful, but in the long run, if that's the only motivation people have to live holy lives, it is harmful. Fear of getting a spanking is not the proper motivation for adult living. It's a temporary measure we use until a child can reason. When I was a kid, my mother used to tell me not to cross the street without looking both ways. If I didn't look both ways before I crossed the street, whether or not any cars were coming, I got a spanking. 
At that age, I could understand that I would get a spanking if I ran out in front of a car, but I didn't. I, but I didn't fear getting hit by a car because I couldn't relate to that kind of consequence. What I feared was getting a spanking because I could relate to that. And this fear made me look both ways when I crossed the street. Today I'm a grown adult. Imagine what it would be like if I crossed the street without looking both ways. And when I got to the other side, I just started trembling and said, Oh, please don't tell my mother. Don't anybody tell my mother what I did. If she found out, she'd spank me. You would think I was strange. You would look at me and say something's wrong with you. The real reason for looking both ways before you cross the street is not because your mother is going to spank you, but because you're going to get run over by a truck sooner or later if you don't do it. As an adult, I'm out from under my mother's dominion. My mother's not going to spank me if I don't look both ways, but it's still wisdom to look both ways because I want to pr preserve my life. However, until I had enough sense to reason, that physical rod was used as a restraint on me to keep me from doing the wrong things. That's why God gave the old law. It was only a temporary measure that pointed to the permanent answer, which is Jesus. Grace. Old Testament people weren't born again. They couldn't receive revelation knowledge as we do. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Old Testament people couldn't understand spiritual things. They weren't born again of spirit like we are. They were under the old law, which pertained to the flesh, which if you're born again, you died to the flesh in the old law, and you rose again in the spirit under grace through faith. Something they could understand. Okay, Old Testament people couldn't understand spiritual things, so God gave them a physical restraint. Something they could understand. They were thinking, well, sin, sin isn't really very bad so God said you don't think so you do this pick up sticks on a Sabbath day and I'll have you stoned to death suddenly they begin to realize God didn't like the way they had been living on the Sabbath day God said if if you don't tithe you're cursed with a curse this is the Old Testament then people said I think God wants us to tithe God said you kill you shall be killed and an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth hand for a hand foot for a foot they got a new understanding of how serious sin was. When God began to reveal his wrath upon sin, suddenly people realized what they had thought was right and wrong was totally off base. Their conscience had been defiled and de deadened. So God had to help them realize what right and wrong really were. The law revived their consciousnesses. Correct use of the law. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed through Christ. Galatians 3.23 People had been trusting themselves for, for salvation, thinking, well, I'm really pretty good. I haven't done everything, anything terribly wrong in a long time, and surely I'm all right now. After law, the law was given, they began to realize, even if I never sin again, I can't do anything to atone for my past sins. They began to realize the hopelessness of their situation. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers and manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. 1 Timothy 1, 8-10 there is a right purpose and use of the law. The correct purpose of the law is to give revelation to people who do not see their need for God. People who do not understand they have transgressed against God have deceived themselves. And the law can be used to show them that they are not going to heaven without salvation through Jesus by the grace of God. I was ministering in Houston, Texas when a man stood up in one of my services and started yelling at me. I tried to talk to him, but he wasn't even coherent. Finally, I just rebuked him and told him to sit down, and he did. After the service was over, he came up to the front and sat down on the front row. He was totally spaced out on drugs and could barely talk to me. I told him, God loves you, and God wants you to change your life. He can set you free and take you out of the bondage you're under. The man said, I don't have any problems. I'm not under any bondage. Everything's cool with me. Everything's fine. I could tell by looking at the guy that it wasn't. So I said, look, God himself can come live on the inside of you and set you free. 
He replied, I am God. God's in the ceiling. God's in the cement. He regarded God as a force and a concept, much like people are doing today, not as a real person. He said, I don't have any sins. Sin is just relative. This man had actually hardened and deceived himself to the point where he didn't even understand God's perfect standard. I had started out ministering love, trying to use the goodness of God to lead him to repentance. But the man was so deceived that his conscience was disconnected. He couldn't recognize a true standard of right and wrong. When I saw that I started using the law on him, I, I took the word of God and began to reveal his sin to him. I cut him from one side to the other. You sorry scum of the earth, you think you're all right, but you're not. You don't have any power, you don't have any joy. I began to reveal every rotten thing on the inside of him. Lust, greed, covetousness, and all other sins God hates. I used the word of God to whittle him down and show him that he needed a savior, Jesus. That he was headed straight for hell unless God intervened in his life. And guess what? The law cut through all his deception. The moment the law comes, the conscience will snap back to a proper godly standard. I don't care how deceived a person has become or how much they think. Drugs are all right, free sex is all right, sin is just relative. You minister the law to them in the right way, and I guarantee you they will see their sinfulness. The Lord will destroy all the deception and cause their conscience to work properly. Okay, all have sinned and came short of the glory of God. So the old law came to show us our need for a Savior, show us that sin was dwelling in our flesh and it was taking us and leading us to death and going to hell. Until that Savior came and set us free from that. So now that we are saved by what he did on the cross, by the faith of Christ, through the grace of God, a free gift. The law came to show us our need for the grace of God. For that we can't do nothing without him. And that we were going and heading to hell. Because of the sin that dwells in the flesh. So we have to be born again of spirit and water. So we die to the flesh on the cross with Christ and rise again in the spirit, living in Christ and Christ living through us now. By He overcame sin. He overcame the flesh. He's conquered all. So now He's living through us. And our lives are dead in Christ, waiting to be glorified and renew, and uh, our glorious bodies and everything when Christ returns. So now we are being carried by the faith of Christ in serving God in spirit and truth in our inner man as our out, outwardly man is perishing, but our inward man is being renewed day by day. Be renewed by the spirit of your mind, your spirit. Nothing good dwells in the flesh, but we serve God through spirit and truth. So that's what the law was there to teach us, to show us our need and to carry us until the Savior came to set us free from the old law. So now that we live under grace, by faith. Okay. The purpose of the law was to show us our need for God, but once we correctly recognize our need for God, the law is totally incapable of producing the relationship, personal relationship with him we need. This is where many people have missed it. After becoming convicted of their sins, they start trying to get a right relationship with God by trying to keep the law. The Old Testament law was full of thou shalt nots. People interpreted them to say God is telling me what I've got to do to earn a relationship with him. Now if it'll just keep, if I'll just keep the Sabbath, honor my father and mother, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness or any of these things, then I'll be alright with God. No, that wasn't what God was teaching. God didn't give us the law so we could keep it and earn our way to heaven because nobody can keep the whole law. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and came fallen short of the glory of God. No one has been capable of keeping the law except Jesus. That's why we have to be saved by faith in him. God didn't give the law so that by keeping it we could earn our way to heaven. Rather, God gave us the law to show us how hopeless we were. It was to show us how sinful we were so we would quit trusting in ourselves and trust in the Lord instead and look to him for salvation. Religion preaches the law. Religion says that unless we go to church and follow an exclusive list of rules, God's not going to answer our prayers and we'll never get to heaven. But if that were true, none of us could have been born again because we sure weren't living right before we were born again. The Old Testament law wasn't given 
so that by keeping it we could earn a relationship with God. It was given to show us knowledge of our sin, condemn us, and destroy any hope of trusting in ourselves for salvation. Imagine an old bull lying in a field thinking, I've been treating everybody mean, I shouldn't be this way, I shouldn't charge everybody who comes through this field, so I'm going to change. I'm not going to be mean anymore, I'm going to be a loving toward everyone. So the bull just lays there in the pasture, chewing his cud and thinking he's changed. But just because he thinks he's changed doesn't mean he has. Walk by that bull just walk by and that bull just looks at you. He doesn't char charge or anything. But pull a red flag out and begin to wave it in front of his face. Suddenly that old bull nature rises up on the inside of him and he here he comes charging. Did the red flag make the bull mean? No. All it did was draw out what was already in him. If people are deceived, it can be beneficial to draw out the negative stuff on the inside of them. If they think they are all right living sinful lives, pull out the law and wave it in front of them. I recall an instance when I saw something was wrong between us and some people we were with. Jamie and I had prayed, and finally the last day we were with them, we just agreed together that the problem would come to the surface so we could deal with it. Do you know what happened? A woman exploded at me and started yelling, saying I was the devil. She totally flipped out of her mind. Satan tried to kill her that day, and it was a terrible scene, but it was good that the negative stuff came out because we were able to deal with it. It was good because they had been under deception. These friends of ours didn't understand what had been going on spiritually, but when they saw how vile the woman became toward me, they recognized something was wrong with her and not me. We countered it with ministry, and we saw all those people set free we are tremendous friends today. The law was used by God in the Old Testament to show us our problem, sin, and to reveal the hopelessness of our situation. This is explained to us in the New Testament, and we see how God will still use the law today if he must. It was a terrible burden to live under the Old Testament law, but it was the best God could offer in those days. Some people may say, now wait a minute, you think God wasn't able to introduce the new covenant back then? That's exactly what I'm saying. The Bible says that Jesus was born in the fullness of time. Galatians 4, 4. Jesus was born just as soon as it was possible for him to come as the savior of the human race. Many prophecies had to be fulfilled and certain things had to take place so God had to deal with mankind and sin in a temporary way by the law. Unfortunately, that temporary way has been interpreted by many people as the true representation of the way God is. They think the law is the way God really wants to deal with mankind, but that is not true. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned, and long after man was expelled from the Garden of Eden, God showed his mercy toward mankind and sought for them to come to repentance only by his goodness, always pointing to the Savior who would come, Jesus. And then God's gift of eternal life came by his grace, while we were yet still sinners. In the fullness of time, Jesus did come. He became a man and lived a perfect, sinless life. He allowed himself to be beaten, whipped, and crucified, ultimately becoming our sin and dying on the cross for us. But then he was res resurrected from the grave three days later, and the earth has not been the same since. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9-10. Jesus inaugurated a new age that now men, women, and children could not only have peace with God, they could know God, and the transformation of the human heart became the greatest miracle by the renewing of our mind. You are a new creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17-18 When you were saved, you became a new creature. Your spirit on the inside was changed, that the scripture is not talking about your physical body becoming new. If you were overweight before you were saved, you were still overweight after you were saved. Your body and all your physical features didn't change and became different. Your mind didn't change. Your spirit is the part of you that was changed, your inner man. A new heart also I will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel thirty six twenty six. Put on the new man, which after God is recreated in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians four twenty four. For he hath made him to be sin for us, 
who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We are new spirits who are righteous and holy. There is no sin in our spirits. Jesus became sin for us so that we may be the righteousness of God in our spirit. Jesus trapped sin in the flesh, but we are no longer held accountable to the old standard, the old law pertaining to the flesh. Now we serve God in spirit and truth through faith. We're justified by our faith and our spirit, not our flesh. We did not get a little bit of the righteousness of God just to get us through this life. We have the total righteousness of God in our spirits, our inner man. Our spirits are as complete and perfect within us right this moment as they will ever be throughout all eternity. We aren't going to get new spirits when we go to be with the Lord. We're going to get new glorified bodies and our souls will be totally changed. So they will know all things. In this life, our bodies have a tendency towards sin and our minds will always need to be renewed. But our spirits within us, right this moment, contain the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts, who seals us, who saves us, who renews us. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this world. 1 John 4.17 As He is, so are we in this world. It is not... So are we going to be, but so are we now. Obviously, this is not speaking of our bodies or our minds, but our spirits. Our spirits are pure, holy, righteous, and clean as they will ever be. And this verse is saying our spirits are once for ounce in a mo molecule for molecule. If there are such things in the spiritual realm identical to the Lord Jesus Christ's spirit, our spirit are totally his workmanship, they're clean, pure, and if we sin, our spirits are never contaminated because it's not our spirits that sin, it's the flesh which we died to on the cross when we're born again. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin because we died to it. We died to the flesh. Jesus is living through us in this flesh. Our spirits are clean. For his seed remaineth in him. We're the body of Christ. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. 1 John 3.9 so it's impossible. I had always heard this verse was about habitual sin. People told me, Brother, you can't habitually sin. You may sin sometimes, but you won't habitually sin or you aren't really born again. But that doesn't hold water because we discovered earlier that what can be called sin is really very broad. Do you know what sin is? Overeating is sin. Do you know any believers who habitually overeat? You never accidentally ate anything in your life. And anybody who's overweight, habitually overweight, has sinned. I'm not condemning anyone. I'm overweight sometimes too, but it doesn't matter if you're 10 pounds or 40 or 50 pounds overweight. A little bit of sin is still sin. God told me in his word that it, this body of mine is a temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm supposed to take care of it and glorify God in whatever I eat or drink or say. Everything I do is supposed to be to the glory of God. If we're overeating, we aren't glorifying God in what we are doing. We're indulging self and self-dominating. Self is still alive instead of being dead, like it's supposed to be. The point I'm making is that all believers habitually sin in some way or another. So I don't believe 1 John 3, 9 is talking about habitual sin. When it said that whoever is born of God cannot commit sin, it meant just exactly what it said. And that's addressing our spirit, man. It's impossible. You are, the spirit is the only part of us that is born of God. And it cannot sin. It does not sin. It's the seed of God within us. We've never sinned with our spirit man. That's why we're justified by faith and through the spirit, not the flesh. We're enticed in the realm of the flesh. And our emotions and our minds may get into sin because of our, our will chooses it. But our spirits are not participating in sin. Our spirits are not being defiled every time we sin. They are not being corrupted. They do not have to be purged. The blood of Jesus does not have to be reapplied to our spirits. That is the concept Hebrew 9, 11 through 12 addresses. Jesus entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption was for the spirit of man in our inner man. Our spirits are the only part of our redemption that is complete now. We have the promise of glorified bodies and our souls being changed, but at this moment our spirits are the only part of us that is complete through redemption if you're born again. But it is complete and eternally complete 
In this life, our spirits are not going to be defiled. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering the offering of oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered once sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, 10 through 12. That's powerful. If we'll just think about it, this will set us free. The offering of the Lord Jesus Christ sanctified us once for all. The writer was contrasting what Jesus did with what the Old Testament priest did. He was pointing out that Jesus does not have to be sacrificed ever again. One of the reasons most of us don't really understand how to completely we've how completely we've been redeemed is because we still have this Old Testament mentality. That's why it says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In the Old Testament redemption was not revealed completely. Every time someone sinned, a new sacrifice had to be made for that sin every year. There had to be a day of atonement when the entire sin of nature was atoned for over and over and sacrifices were made again and again year after year under the Old Testament law. So, that's the difference. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So we are worshiping God in spirit and truth, no longer with the flesh by the old law. That's what it is. So I love you guys. Keep studying your Bibles, and I hope this opens your eyes. If you have any questions, please comment below. Love you guys. Share this video. Subscribe. In Jesus' name, amen.